All right, let's keep this rowdy crowd under control here. Folks. Jeez. Pretty wild group here. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm Jason Hill, conservation biologist with Vermont Center for Eco Studies. I busted out my tie tonight. I felt a little nostalgic. First time in minus funerals and weddings, I've had a tie on in half a decade. Um, I've never seen it before. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> a hooded sweatshirt just doesn't seem to fit this room so much. But the, I did my first research out of, out, of, out of college with sea otters for a year in California, and I just felt a little nostalgic tonight. I guess I don't know. So. Um, so welcome. I'm very excited to see you here, and I hope you got out to your town voting tonight. Um, before I introduce Aaron Weed, our speaker here from the National Park Service, I just wanted to, to say, if you haven't had a chance, if you didn't see um, an opinion piece that our director, Chris Rimmer, and our director of science, uh, John Lloyd, happened to pen, it appeared in Vermont Digger, uh, Burlington Free Press, and a couple other places, and I thought it made a, a well-crafted, articulate, and passion plea for science as being a component of the discussion at the table and for an argument that science should be presented in a non-politicized way and that it should be used as a tool to help us make informed decisions about the world. And if you want to read that piece, it's on Vermont Digger, but you can also go to our website at btecostudies.org. Right at the top there, there's a link to it. It's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice piece for basically maintaining the um, independence of science in our society. Having said that, and I think you're in for a great treat tonight for some excellent science. Uh, thank you to Aaron Weed for coming over. Are you in Woodstock? Or I'm Woodstock? based in Woodstock. I live in Dunbridge. Right. So thank, please give a, when you have a chance after the talk, thanks Aaron for coming over and spending his night tonight to be here with us. Um, Aaron is uh, with the, the Northeast Temperate Network Inventory and Monitoring Program for the National Park Service, formerly postdoc here at Dartmouth and University of Idaho. Yep, before right. that, yep. Uh, quite a few degrees, University of Maine, University of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I'm missing something in there. Uh, yeah, I, did my under, I grew up in Maine. My undergraduate was in uh, Orono, Maine, and then Florida for my Florida. master's. Yeah, and then PhD Rhode Island. at Rhode Island. Yep. Right. Um, and Aaron's here to talk. To the specimens on the table and this book's over here, incredible stuff that you're going to hear Aaron talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, he's going to tell us about some of the population, uh, some of the abiotic and biotic factors that drive population dynamics for some of these visitors to New England, the bark beetles and uh, invasive plant species, species and he's gonna, he's gonna tell us a lot about them, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jason, for that intro. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't put my hand over that microphone. Um, and thanks so much for the invitation. It was a, it was a real pleasure to, to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, full disclaimer, I am a government employee working for the National Park Service. I am going to talk about climate change and, uh, you know, because and I think the National Park Service stance is that we can actually still talk about that. But also a lot of this is my own personal uh, research mm -hmm. uh, that Jason alluded to that was done right here uh, at Dartmouth. Uh, and a lot of the messages have been sort of, uh, you know, they're coming out of my mouth or also uh, have been sort of originated by some of my colleagues here, uh, notably Matt Ayers and then down at UMass and Joe Elkington. A lot of this work that I'm going to talk about today have been done in uh, collaboration with. Um, this is going to be really informal for me, so if, I, if you need me to clarify any kind of uh, something that I'm saying, a concept, a, a definition, just raise your hand or yell at me or something like that. Uh, let me know, stop me, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll explain. Um, I did bring some specimens. These are all things that I collected over the years. I mean, it's not quite all of it, but just to show you some things that are actually living in our forests around us. Most of this stuff is from New England. Some of it's probably from Europe and uh, Florida, but for the most part, it's there. And then there are some other kind of resources, uh, which I hope I don't have to allude to when you guys ask me tough questions. Uh, but, you know, some of the uh, products that are in the, in the Northeast and, and around the nation, if you guys are interested in looking at some pictures and so forth. Um, yeah, so today I, I just want to kind of give an overview of some of the work that we've been doing with the main kind of points that are really focused on uh, that I want to come back to are that, you know, climate change and uh, non-native, uh, our native and non-native forest insects are having really dramatic consequences on our forests. Uh, in the Northeast, but also worldwide. Um, and I think that they're really fun fundamentally changing the way that we manage and think about uh, forests into the future, and also really having strong impacts on the services that they provide to us. Um, 
and sort of the old, I think it's the 60s slogan of forest uh, stewardship is based on plant your own tree. Well, I think that that's uh, maybe still valid at some level, but there is much more to forest stewardship going forward, uh, given some of these concerns about how climate and non-native insects in particular are affecting these resources. So I wanted to start out kind of with like a little mind exercise, and I promise it won't be hard. And actually, it might start like it sounded like a bit of a meditative exercise, but I promise it's not that either. But I just want to kind of develop the concept here where I'm coming from of how we think about the way insects are responding to climate in particular and, and weather. Um, so sort of imagine like you're this one of these past weekends, you know, it was 10 degrees with a negative five wind chill. Uh, you're sitting outside, uh, you're freezing or whatever, and you're sitting there. And what, and what do you do to stay warm? Uh, and you, you know, what do you guys do to stay warm? Yeah. <laughs> So you have that option to go inside, that's right, you shiver, you might, you might put on another coat, uh, you might invite a friend to come closer to you, you know, and actually if it gets too cold you might even move south or something like that. Well, you know, we have many behaviors and physio physiological mechanisms that allow us to kind of cope with that cold. What do you think an insect does in the forest when that happens, when it's that cold? Well, actually, it doesn't do anything because it can't move because it's so cold that it, and its, bio, its uh, activity is so directly linked to that ambient temperature that it just can't move. And so as it gets colder and colder, as you get into the winter, uh, it's just sitting there and sitting there. And um, a lot of insects that, particularly in this uh, part of the woods, uh, are uh, gaining this cold hardiness. So, uh, hardiness excuse me. so they're actually synthesizing alcohols in their blood. Um, over time, just like antifreeze. You put antifreeze in your car to basically increase or decrease the uh, uh, freezing point. So they're doing this and doing this over time and as the temperature goes down and down, um, they're still synthesizing these alcohols until a point where it gets so cold uh, that they end up freezing. And so they're, they're basically the water in their uh, body crystallizes. And the temperature at which it does is what we call the super cooling point and scientists have all fancy ways to measure that. And that's actually a really uh, effective way of figuring out the temperature at which a lot of these insects die. And that temperature, that super cooling point, that really, really cold winter temperature is actually something that's really relevant to management in that uh, it sets sort of the northerly distribution, I think, for a lot of our organisms. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar. Who, is, who are gardeners here? Um, most of you, I hope, or some of you at least, you know what U USDA hardiness zones are. Well, they're based uh, generally on this coldest night of the winter. Um, and it's because these organisms have to survive that cold temperature. Um, so that's one way that we know that, uh, one metric that we use to evaluate how insects can survive at certain places and different times of, uh, well, uh, in this case, of the winter. So now imagine in another sort of example that you're sort of maybe in Florida on like a really, really hot day. Uh, you have a fan in your hand and it starts out relatively like a cool uh, morning, but then it gets really hot. This is like August in the middle of, of the summer. And as it gets uh, warmer and warmer, you start kind of moving that fan and sort of as you know, the fast, you know, you're doing it, uh, the frequency at which you're doing that sort of increases with sort of that temperature. So at some point you're, you know, you slow or then you do it faster and faster. Well, that's actually kind of analogous to as you sort of, once it gets warm enough and insects can start developing, kind of turning on that switch, it gets warm enough. You know, you see bees maybe on a plant on a cold morning kind of flapping their wings or kind of getting that temperature up. Well, once it gets warm enough and it continues to get warm like that sun in that Florida beach and you're doing this, well, that fan action as you increase it with temperature is kind of analogous to them increasing their activity and their development. So it gets warmer, they can move faster, they can eat faster, and that actually turns out that it allows them to grow faster as well. Um, but just like cold winters, uh, hot, hot summers can actually be uh, a big problem as well. And so there's the other side of the distribution where it gets too hot. What happens? Your hand, you're doing this, this, and you just stop because your hand hurts so much. Well, for an insect, they probably just die because they can't uh, cope with that kind of heat. And so they kind of, uh, you know, they live within this sort of the Goldilocks zone of, of wanting to be uh, in the middle where they can develop. Uh, it can't be too cold, it can't be too warm. And so when we think about climate change and we think about the way that <coughs> climate influences insect biology and their physiology, this is kind of the way that we're, kind of the context of what we're thinking about when we make predictions about um, if it gets warmer. 
well, we know that as it gets warmer, insects develop faster, well, then that means that uh, they can probably produce more generations a year, and that's been, uh, we've seen that with some research. Um, and that also, if it doesn't get as cold as it used to anymore, they can actually survive uh, more, and they actually, uh, in some cases, they can survive at higher latitudes or more farther north than uh, they, they were used to. And so those are kind of the, the broad concepts of which we're thinking about ways to, uh, some of the work that we've done as part of the climate assessment and uh, some other research primarily funded through the Forest Service is to uh, evaluate how these things are going to adapt or change, excuse me, in a, um, in a warming future. So um, the last kind of uh, thought exercise, excuse me, is to think about... Um, Think about a, uh, like a, a castle, let's call it a French castle and like, you know, a hundred years war or something time of battling the English or whoever you like more, you, you can have a castle. Uh, that castle within it has a number of builders. Uh, and those builders are also, are basically building the foundation blocks of, of that castle. Uh, within there, there's also archers that are sitting there and they're keeping all the intruders out. Well, in this sort of uh, example, uh, a tree, we think of a tree uh, as, the, as the actual castle and then the intruders are actually the insects and diseases that are trying to get into that uh, <coughs> castle. And so what the builders are doing uh, is that they're building the blocks, they're putting on the growth, they're putting on the structural components of the tree uh, that actually prevent, well it, it makes it grow up tall of, of course, but it actually prevents insects and other things from actually attacking it. Uh, so converting uh, you know, sugars into starch which is a fairly indigestible you know, compound uh, but also putting on bark, which is actually a really good barrier, it turns out, for insects and other diseases to invading. Um, and then you have the archers or whatever, which are more of the, uh, the resistance mechanisms, like if you go up to a pine tree and you gouge it and you get sap, that's kind of the archer keeping uh, all of the intruders out. Um, and so climate uh, affects the builders and the archers, essentially, in defending the tree, that fort against those insects. Um, and what's uh, really, in, and so that's another context of which we know that if climatic effects are influencing uh, the tree growth, uh, the builders, uh, if that stresses that, that can weaken the tree, its defenses, its sort of structural defenses to insects. Um, if it's, uh, the tree's not getting enough water or enough sunshine or whatever, that can actually influence the builders and the archers, its ability to defend itself. And so those types of examples kind of frame the context again of how we think about the ways, the pathways at which climate can influence the interactions of insects uh, with their actually trees, which actually result into being some, can be some very dramatic effects uh, on forest health. Um, so he, the phone was talking to me today about, you know, earlier about uh, all these outbreaks that are happening out west, the mountain pine beetle, for example. Um, that is one of those situations where we are in general agreement that there's a couple of things going on. In some areas it might be that uh, climate is influencing the tree chemistry and, and preventing these trees from defending themselves, but it's also because that the climate is getting warm enough that it's permitting these species to grow faster uh, and actually not as many die in the winter. Um, but before I get into some of the work that I want to talk a little bit about uh, that we did sort of here in the Northeast and which is much more relevant to the, uh, the Northeastern states, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about insects in our forests. Um, I brought a lot of insects in here right now. Um, most of these are not actually pests and actually it turns out that the large majority of our insects in these forests aren't pests at all. It's usually the ones that are in the pests that we know the most about because they affect the things that we care uh, most about. Uh, but there are things in the forest that are decomposing wood. Uh, there are actually predators that have nothing to do with eating and killing trees. They might even be protecting the trees at some, at some level. So these forests are, uh, are home to lots of um, organisms. They're also home to lots of you know, other birds and, and so forth that the VCE group studies. I know that they've got some publications and looking at how forest structure influences that. So there's some really important components of forests and uh, things that forest insects that are pests can really, that, that can affect. Um, one of the points that I want to sort of make today is that um, everybody, and I'll, get, I'll talk a bit more about non-native insects, and everybody knows non-native insects because they're so much in the literature and, and in, in, in the media, uh, but uh, it turns out that actually, did you know that uh, 
you know, most of the damage that happens in our North American forests are actually attributed to our native forest insects. Um, and that of all of that native, of all of the, uh, the damage that happens in our forests, they actually damage more area uh, than actually forest fires do in, in certain, uh, you know, certain periods of time. So these native forest insects are a huge component of the disturbance within our forests around the world. And they've always had uh, big influences on the way that we manage um, our forest. And I think at some level, um, they have, at least out west, I would say at some degree, the aesthetics that we think about with certain forest structure is attributed to the disturbances as well, the types of species that grow there. Um, but the other point that I wanted to make are that, you know, unlike the western United States, uh, in the northeast, we actually don't have a lot of these really major uh, native forest insects that are taking out literally hundreds and thousands of trees at a time, uh, like the western bark beetles. But we do have one, and that's the spruce budworm. And some of you guys uh, might uh, remember the outbreaks that happened in the last one in about the 70s. This is a little uh, caterpillar that feeds on uh, primarily fir, but also spruce. Uh, it sort of develops in the early spring, feeds on the developing uh, leaf buds, uh, and then goes through its life cycle and then over winter as well. Uh, right this year in northern New England is the start of its, thir of its uh, outbreak, which happens every 35 years or so. And this is actually really, really impressive because you know most forest entomologists only get to really see this once in, a, once in their lifetime. So for people like me, it's kind of exciting. For foresters, it's actually kind of scary because there's some major economic consequences. Uh, something else that's in the forest around here that's kind of ticking up uh, recently is forest tent caterpillar. Uh, that thing that makes all those nasty tents um, on the ends of those trees. Well, this uh, last year, uh, we started to see an uptick in some of the catches of those. Uh, and this is a species that doesn't go sort of these periodic outbreaks every 35 years, it happens every 10 years. Um, and this kind of, and the reason why these outbreaks of these, particularly these caterpillars, rise and fall are actually the fall part is really due to strong interactions with natural enemies, primarily parasitoid wasps that sting them. Um, and that kind of brings up the last kind of uh, way that we think about climate influencing forest pest uh, populations are that climatic change and warming or uh, changes uh, across our region, if they influence sort of the uh, parasitoids and their behavior and their survival, they could actually influence these larger outbreaks as well. So it's kind of we're waiting to see in Canada where there's been actually quite a bit of warming. Has this done anything to the uh, interaction of the spruce budworm with its uh, native uh, natural enemies up there? So will the, will the outbreak last as long or will it last longer? These are, I think, really interesting questions and things to, to see that have really important bearing on uh, timber industries and other types of industries that are, you know, uh, that dependent on those wood resources. Um, so I wanted to come back and talk a little bit about bark beetles because I think bark beetles are neat and it's some of the work that I was doing right here um, over in Hanover. Um, bark beetles are a class of uh, little, tiny, tiny, things that look like this, and I'll try to, I'll, I'll send these around. Um, basically, some of them, well, I'll just start out saying that most of them don't kill trees, most of them feed on dead wood, um, and so they're not really pests, but there are a couple out there that really, that's what they do, they kill trees, uh, and those are in the genus Dendroctinus, which just means tree killer, it turns out, and I'll kind of <coughs> send these around this way, and is if you can see them, I apologize, I don't have any kind of lens or anything, but you can get the scope from seeing how small they are. Um, and what these guys generally do, it's a typical beetle life cycle. They have an egg, uh, a larval, pupil stages, and then an adult stage. Um, and the species that we've been working on uh, recently is the southern pine beetle, um, which is historically distributed something from Texas. Uh, well, it gets down into Central America, actually. But in the United States, it's Texas into the mid-Atlantic uh, states. Perennial pest, uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, impacts on uh, pine plantations in the southeast. Um, people literally grow pines in a different way in the southeast because of this species. Uh, well, in the early 2000s, uh, they were started to see out. They started to find uh, mortality in uh, pitch pine, which is this kind of scrubby pine that you find uh, on Cape Cod and parts of southern New England, and uh, in particularly in, in New Jersey pine barrens. 
Uh, so some foresters went, went there and they checked it out and they actually turns out that they had mortality from this bark beetle and they found out that it was a southern pine beetle and they're like, huh, this is weird, this doesn't happen here, what's going on? And so uh, actually Matt Ayers, who's at uh, biology here at Dartmouth, started working on this and I came in later to the game uh, and I just kind of want to steal his thunder a little bit but talk about what we did together which was looking at that uh, actually, if we looked at some temperature data, um, and since like around the 1960s, it turns out that um, the climate has completely become conducive for colonization by uh, southern pine beetle. Remember at the beginning of the talk, I was talking about how those cold winters really limit the northern distributions. Well, if you look at those cold temperatures in and around Atlantic City and these other areas, it, since 1960 or so, the coldest night of the winter is increased by about seven degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's not like the three degrees Fahrenheit global average everybody's throwing around there with like, uh, you know, uh, as the, you know, the daily, uh, the annual average. Excuse me, this is like the coldest side of the winter. And for these organisms, this is actually the difference between living and dying. And so what is pretty clear is that the uh, winters have warmed up so much that have permitted them from to uh, expand their range into southern uh, New Jersey and begin killing those trees. Uh, what's even more devastating is just like last year they found them in southern New England. So now southern pine beetle, which is actually becoming more like the northern or mid-Atlantic pine beetle, um, is now in Cape Cod, uh, southern Rhode Island, uh, and they're also looking for it now in New, uh, New, uh, New Hampshire. And, and, and one, of the, one of the points about this is that uh, climate change that we're seeing is, is having really strong effects on these organisms and it's creating new challenges within forestry. Pitch pine has never seen southern pine beetle. Um, some other work that we also did uh, with southern pine beetle is that right here in the lab is that we figured out that um, the seasonal temperatures as it gets cold in the winter up here but it's warm in the summer actually uh, creates this really interesting um, seasonality in the beetle. One of the things I didn't mention about is that these trees um, are defending themselves with resin and southern pine beetle needs to uh, basically mass attack these trees. It needs to call on its friends. So what it does is it emerges in the spring and then it disperses and when it finds a tree females will bore into the tree. She'll send out a pheromone which is basically a chemical message to say hey come and find me and that will bring her nearest 20,000 or so friends. And then they start boring all into the tree and they need to do this to deplete that resin. And it's basically just, the resin just falls out of the tree. And then they swim through it and then they begin laying their eggs in that. Well, that mass attacking behavior, as it's called, is actually seems to be, uh, well, you, you need to have a, a large number of beetles emerging at the same time in order for that to happen. And it turns out that uh, in the south where you have eight generations or so, you know, life cycles that you can complete in per year, there's a lot of staggering of these life cycles, but the cold winters uh, actually cause these life stages to pool up, so that means that once they, once that sort of, once it gets warm enough in the spring for things that light kind of, that switch comes on and they can start developing, again they're in that, sort of on that beach or whatever, they're warming up, they're able to all emerge at the same time and they're all ready to mass attack these trees. So they're becoming really effective uh, and it's all really mediated through climate. Um, so it's all, it, it's really kind of devastating and, and I didn't mention this at the first point but I will say that a lot of these stories are maybe a little depressing but I'll try to come around to maybe some of the opportunities out of some of this and, uh, and I'll, I'll try to find that throughout. But these are all, uh, you know, I think it's really eye-opening to say that we have some big challenges on our hands. Yes? Is, uh, is the southern range also moving north? So are they leaving behind their habitat? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, that, I think the jury's still out on that. Uh, but what we, they are finding are that the, in the southern range, there's a, uh, there aren't really as many outbreaks as there used to be historically. And so that's actually what Matt has been working on with some of his graduate students and pursuing more is how uh, their, um, you know, whether it's hot temperatures or what's, what's limiting them. We worked mainly on sort of the cold kind of temperatures and, and, and so forth. Uh, and sort of the seasonal development, yeah. You imply that these intense attacks are worse for the trees? Is that right? Yeah, the, so the tree has a certain level of resin that it just, once it gets attacked, it just wants to push out. So you need a certain number of beetles in order to bore into the tree to actually make sure that, that it's basically overcoming that defense. And these beetles are so good, uh, they're smaller than the size of a grain of rice, but when you have, you know, 
50,000 of them together, they're just like taking little drills and they're drilling in and so you need many, many thousands of so, them. So do you see worse attacks when it happens in the Northeast than down in South Carolina? Uh, it just, uh, because pitch pine is a more susceptible host, it doesn't take as many beetles to actually overcome the defense. Okay. They have, beetles have all sorts of other interesting mechanisms where once this tree has been attacked, they can divert it to another tree. They use pheromones to do that. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, that's a, good, a really good question. Yeah? Um, if you have a lead like you just did where it was 60 and 50 and then it goes down to 3, is that not a big enough um, yeah, so southern pine beetle is sort of, a, I think, a wuss when it comes down to like a lot being cold hardy. Um, so uh, it's a really good question. Uh, in general, like we think that once that temperature exceeds that certain super cooling point, they're all dead, and that's usually true. But there could be uh, lots of mortality when that when there's a lot of variation as of that warming and then that cooling. Because what's happening, I didn't explain this that well, is that as it gets colder every day, every day they're producing more and more of those. Uh, alcohols in their blood to antifreeze but when it warms up they're also trying to reduce they're reducing that as well it's sort of their their way of telling what the weather is and if it kind of goes back and forth then yeah you could have some really strong and uh, some high mortality um, I want to yeah I want to move on uh, I've been talking for I guess a little under a half an hour so I want to move on to some non-native stuff um, so you said that I do have an hour I'll, I won't take that long but let me just talk about some work that we did down at UMass uh, recently. So non-native insects are another really important component of our forest ecosystems. Um, really, really, uh, you know, everybody hears about them in the news, and as I said before, I think everybody knows about what our non-native insects are compared to our natives. You know, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, um, there's, you know, winter moth. Uh, these are all uh, coming to a, a forest near you. Um, you know, uh, and they're going to have, you know, beech bark disease. These are having very dramatic effects on these forests. Uh, folks in the area might remember uh, chestnut, elm, uh, and then seeing the devastating effects of those uh, diseases coming in. Very similar types of trends are happening, and this is all fueled through the global uh, market. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes in on infested pallets or infested nursery stock. Um, and so, but the influence of climate is actually very similar on these non-native insects that are having these really dramatic effects. And uh, I just want to talk about a little bit about some work about another insect you probably heard a little bit about is uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which is just found, I believe, last year in southern Windsor County. So um, of any of these organisms, uh, it's coming here. Uh, we don't know. I mean, you, we can predict uh, how long it's going to take. Uh, just like southern pine beetle, it seems to be that its northern limits are actually really restricted um, by cold temperatures. Um, and it might be one cold year that it takes to really knock them back. Um, but some folks down at UMass also kind of think that it could be uh, that, that summer, hot summer temperatures actually might be limiting this insect quite a bit as well. And this is really what I consider the, the, you know, really the Goldilocks species. It doesn't like it too cold or it doesn't like it too hot. Um, and it actually likes it towards uh, the cooler side. So hemlock really adelgid is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an, a, basically adelgids are aphids of conifers. Everybody knows that aphids also will plant lice. Uh, and adelgids are sort of a specialized group that feeds specifically on conifers. We have many native species in the nor in North America. We have also a couple of bad ones, balsam woolly adelgid and hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlock woolly adelgid was brought in on infested nursery stock back in the 1950s in Richmond, Virginia. It then basically spread up the Appalachian uh, range pretty quickly, both north and south. If you go from Georgia, uh, basically through about Pennsylvania, uh, there aren't a lot of eastern hemlocks uh, left, uh, or Canada hemlocks depending. We are sort of the last frontier of eastern hemlock, I think, in northeastern North America. Um, so it's got, you can see now, I mean, the devastating losses that could happen. Um, there are places, you know, being in the Park Service uh, down in Shenandoah National Park that is called like Hemlock uh, Cove or something, there aren't any more hemlocks there. It's actually quite devastating. Um, but there's still a lot of interest in understanding of why is hemlock woolly adelgid uh, moving around and, and what are, you know, is it winter temperature, is it summer temperature, and what's influencing its biology. Um, and some recent research that we've done that I did in cooperation with some folks at UMass, 
has actually found that the story is not really that, uh, it's not that concrete yet. It's not just summer or winter. It could be, and there could be some opportunities in here. So for example, um, we were doing some studies where we're basically, uh, yeah, we were infesting trees, but that's what we do as experimental biologists. We try to manipulate different populations, and we were doing this on different hemlocks. Um, we had procedures that we could actually kill the adelgids with insecticides if we needed to, but the idea was to try to look at how these different factors in the environment influence the adelgid. And so uh, we basically uh, purposely inoculated different branches at different densities, and then uh, we removed all of this, what we call the inoculum. And when we removed all of this and confirmed that we had actually uh, established all of these populations, we had this huge, uh, excuse me, and this was also in the spring, um, uh, and maybe I'll back up and tell you a little bit about the biology first. So adelgid has a really complex biology. It, it has a two generations, so it goes from egg, nymph, and to adult twice a year. Uh, and around here, uh, the adults will overwinter. They begin producing eggs in about the late March, early April, depending on where you are, maybe into May. Uh, that give ri gives rise to these little, what they're called crawlers. Uh, and this is the only mobile stage of the insect where they uh, get up and they walk and they basically settle onto the branches and then they stick their stylets or their mouth parts, it's the straw, into the base of the uh, hemlock uh, needles. And then, they be, then they stay there the rest of their life. Uh, they're asexual, so they're all genetic clones of one another. And, and again, once they settle, they don't move at all. They're sessile. Uh, and they're called woolly adelgids because they put this waxen, sugary kind of wool on their back, which provides a, a bit of protection from predators and maybe does a bit of humidity control or something, uh, some other kind of function for them. Well, what we did is we took the adults chock full of eggs and when we went, right when the eggs were about to hatch, we put them on the new branches so we can create experimental populations of different densities and essentially look at predator effects and all these other things. Um, well, what happened when we did that and we confirmed the little crawlers were crawling is that we had this huge, uh, and this was in spring, we had these 70 to 80 degree days that just came out of nowhere. We didn't think anything of it, went back. Uh, we came back two weeks later, took some samples, put them under the microscope. I said, oh yeah, great, they have established they're there. We've got populations, we did this right. Came back a couple of weeks ago to look at the, the development where they were there and did this a couple of times. And then after like a month, we were like, what's going on? They're not even developing. We thought they all died. Well, one thing I didn't tell you about the biology is that the next generation in the summer when it comes out here in like June or July, they, once the eggs hatch, the crawlers disperse, and then they go into what's called diapause. It's a de developmental delay. Uh, we call it estivation sort of in the summer. Uh, and basically they're shutting down. Uh, again, this is sort of the, their Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. So they completely avoid the entire summer in this developmental delay on the edge of these branches. And then in the fall, they start their life cycle again. Well, what happened in our experiment, we found that instead of completing one, one generation, they actually, this sort of coincidental warmth that happened right in line with a normal sort of uh, developmental sort of seasonality you know, year, basically put them all into diapause, uh, which is really unexpected uh, because normally they go through a generation and then they go through diapause after that. Um, which was, has never been reported before and, and it was just a coincidence uh, really. Uh, and, and again, we thought that they died. We did some experiments actually right here in Hanover and, and uh, Amherst to confirm that actually when you cool them down, they start developing again. So we confirmed that they were actually weren't dead, they were in a d delay. Well, we kept following this population and we found that instead of completing two generations a year, uh, which is... Um, which means that they would have the opportunity to create eggs, uh, eggs you know, twice every year. They only did it once. And so basically by having that very coincidental hot blast of warmth in the, in the summer, we completely changed the trajectory, of the, it completely changed the trajectory of their development in, from producing two generations to one. So, um, so from a population dynamics point of view, that's actually a really big deal. Uh, it could really actually decrease the population growth over time, i.e. make it, you know, it could influence whether it's a pest or not. Uh, so that was really exciting. And so I just wrap up and say that, you know, we know that climate is having in general that warming winters are increasing risk to forest pests, permitting range expansions, uh, in, you know, increasing survival, speeding up development. You can get uh, more bugs coming out in a particular year and they're influencing our native species, they're influencing our non-native species. But there are also some really curious things that are happening uh, 
because of the in potentially increased variation of warm events coming at times where they didn't. For example, uh, in our experiment uh, where we transplanted, I just mentioned, it, so the probability of those warm temperatures happening at that time of year is something like 0 0.001. You know, so these are, uh, it happened like, you know, I don't know, like, uh, like five times in the last like 90 years or something like that. Uh, really, really extraordinary. And so there are lots of things about the biology of these organisms that we really don't know and that there could be some opportunities that maybe this climate warming is going to certainly allow trees to grow faster. Um, which might provide some opportunities for our, our local timber products and supporting those folks. But it also might having some impact on some of these pests that we spend so much money and so concerned about. doesn't mean that we can't stop being concerned about them, but I think it means that we should be looking a little bit more deeper into their biology. Uh, particularly being insects and uh, cold-blooded, they're reacting to this very strongly. And for something like Emil Humlock woolly adelgid, which poses such a major concern to us, I think it's relevant that we do some of these studies to figure that out. Um, the other part I just want to kind of touch upon is that kind of like the what can we do and what are we doing kind of components. Um, you know, non-native species are coming into this country um, because of, you know, the, the global trade. So you hear a lot of these things now, uh, buy local, burn local. Well, that's to prevent the spread of a lot of these species via firewood. Uh, but, it, but the whole idea of buying local and supporting your local timber or other kind of products will actually, I think, essentially will reduce the, uh, I guess, our um, reliance on some of these exports, which are essentially going to reduce the threats that we have. And these aren't separate from, uh, you know, these are also, I guess, embedded within climate warming, because as it gets warmer here in the winter, it get, becomes more, more hospitable for things that arrive here on some kind of ship or in some kind of pallet in the back of a warehouse that you didn't used to be able to survive. Um, the other kind of point that I'm trying to talk about with some folks in the Park Service in particular, uh, which is actually a really great experiment. We don't actually manage, well, actually Marsh Billings here in Woodstock where I work is the only one that actively manages forests in the Park Service. It's sort of a really a sit and wait approach and I'm kind of waiting to see how this is going to bear out. Uh, the point, and this is because uh, when we have emerald ash borer, or Asian longhorn beetle, chestnut blight, these things that are coming into our environment, a lot of people want to uh, absorb, you know, get the economic value out of the timber that's out there. So they go and they cull all of these trees, the mature ones, the biggest ones. Well, what we're doing while you're doing that is actually removing the potential to find natural resistance in the landscape um, to these organisms. Uh, and an example of this is with Hemlock woolly adelgid in uh, New Jersey, they've actually went in this area where the adelgid wiped through, caused like 99.9% .9 mortality of big mature hemlocks, and they found one or two standing. Like, why that is, why is that? They took, some, they took some cuttings, they propagated them, and they were like, wow, these naturally have resistance to adelgids. And so, instead of going around the landscape and cutting things, uh, maybe preserving some of these mature trees and making and checking, there's gonna be a lot of mortality, no doubt, but there's an opportunity to find some of, the, some of these native genotypes that can survive these and, and actually are going to be the genotypes that are allowing us to reestablish these forests. And I mentioned the Park Service because we don't do anything to, when these things happen. We might remove hazard trees once they die, but I'm really hoping that these can actually be um, active areas where we can collect some of these genotypes to then use in propagating into the future if it's a possibility. It's, it's a, I think it's a, a small chance because we own such small areas within the forested landscape, but I think that there's some potential there. Um, What's the policy of the National Forest Service? National Park Service or the U.S. Forest Service? U.S. Forest Service. Um, well, U.S. Forest Service, uh, I think it varies. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of those are timber producing uh, areas, and so they're either trying to promote healthy uh, growth uh, and, and potentially timber. Um, foresters and ecologists tend to have different, and forest ecologists tend to have different uh, ideas of what forests should look like. Um, so, yeah, they would probably either cull out those to get the economic value. Um, certainly, the ones that are already dead, and, and they, they would do this anyway, is to, to promote sanitation. Uh, but it's a good it's a good point that uh, and I don't actually know how they stand on all of this. I'm, we're trying to have those conversations. Imagine there's not a great um, communication between the Forest Service and Park Service. Uh, but any anyway, so I, I think that there in some areas that might be better at, at sort of waiting, you know, to see what these impacts are uh, versus doing the preemptive cutting. Yeah.
isn't there an attempt to remove uh, a diseased population to keep the, the disease from spreading past that point? That's absolutely I mean, right. I mean, I mean uh, it's not all economics. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so like the you know forestry, silviculture, uh, you find diseased or damaged trees, you move them, you remove them out. So sometimes they might not have that opportunity, at least initially, to spread through that plantation or so. So I think I'll wrap up uh, with that. I, I, I'm just going to, I have my some notes here, but I think that that was the last kind of point that I wanted to make. Um, a little plug, you know, for the, for what we're doing at Marsh Billings, which again, I mentioned the Rockefeller Foundation has put in endowment. So to basically manage the forest there, and they have a really active forest management plan, which is now um, has a little bit of a climate change angle into promoting some of the actual more what we would consider resilient forest species under a changing climate. And we're using my program's data, which actually sits in the background and just monitors forest regeneration, the, thing, the next generation of trees to see actually whether or not they're hitting those uh, benchmarks and, and going on from there. Um, yeah? Um, I told you before about before acid rain, it used to rain 0.3% hydrogen peroxide and the roots are on an oxygen system. And I wonder if uh, the, uh, the immunity of the trees isn't affected by acid rain because they, do no, they no longer have the oxygen. And uh, if, if, if you could take some 3% hydrogen peroxide diluted 10 times and water some uh, <coughs> trees that you, you might want to save, you could check it out and the other trees are sick and this tree survived, that that would be the reason why. Yeah, so acid rain, uh, you know, ch changing the chemistry of the soil, leaching particularly uh, calcium, uh, it really is a stress on, on uh, sugar maple. Uh, for example, uh, it, it, you know, it, it'll basically, it won't uh, really allow the builders to do their job building. Um, and uh, that can in turn stresses the trees, makes a sort of a suboptimal growth and insects are just waiting for that to happen. Um, you know, that castle, that fort that I was talking about before is actually really big and, and scary for a lot of these insects to actually, you know, get, you know, to, to actually get through. Bark beetles have a way of doing that by amassing all of their friends uh, and using pheromones, but a lot of insects actually can't do that. Uh, so like the sugar maple borer, for example, is only really going to attack sugar maples that are physiologically old or that are stressed, you know, just because they can't defend themselves anymore. So uh, absolutely. So I didn't get into all of the other kind of environmental stressors. I was focusing on mainly climate, uh, but acid rain and a lot of these other kinds of pollutants uh, will have very dramatic effects on the ability of these trees to uh, grow. Um, any, any forester knows that trees that are not growing suboptimally are uh, going to be potentially influenced by diseases or insects. It's just waiting to happen. And that's why you manage forests for the best type healthy growth so that they have the best opportunity to defend themselves. So any, I'll take some yeah, questions. Yeah. So we are Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, of course they nourish their trees. It's their, you know, uh, I was just talking to a, a, a guy the other day, he just took a loan out on the sugar bush. So, I mean, yeah, he's, he's very, uh, you know, just to buy that land. I mean, he's investing in that. Um, you know, so uh, acid rain, uh, the situation with acid rain in generally has gotten better. The Clean Air Act has done a lot uh, to improve that. There's definitely areas where there's a lot of concern about uh, you know, uh, different types of deposition uh, influencing the chemistry. Um, I think that, you know, in sugar maple decline was something that was really big, I believe, in, in the 70s, and I think that things have gotten better. Um, but you know, the risk of, is it a threat in Vermont affecting the maple? Like so Asian longhorn beetle yeah. is, uh, is one of the only non-natives that are, are, is, prefers maples. Uh, it's now in, around Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and actually, I've got one right here. Uh, it's this guy right here. I can send this one around too. Did you guys get the, on the last one? I'll pass it this way. It's the big one with his wings open. Uh, it's a big uh, clunky flyer. Um, the reason why it's gotten such out of hand in Worcester is it was there undetected for about 10 years. 
uh, but it's been eradicated from a number of cities around the U.S. and it's because uh, it doesn't move that fast. It's very easy to detect, generally anyway, uh, when people know it's there, I guess. Um, and so there is, a, there is a possibility that there's risk to maples into the future, but I think we're going to see it coming and we're going to be able to be really proactive about it. We still don't know how Asian longhorn beetle is going to be doing with the winters up here. Uh, for example, I think the biggest thing that's gotten some of the uh, maple syrup producers concerned are really the change in weather influencing the uh, freeze and you know the cold nights, the freezing nights and the warm day, that whole um, uh, cycle which you know that's why there's not a lot of maple sap production in the southeast or in the, along the Appalachians but you have sugar maple. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess it's a different question. You know, I put lime on my grass. Oh, yeah. Will they start to fertilize and put particular things on their maple? Oh, yeah, no, I, and, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, a ton about the sugar maple industry, but my sense is that they're, yeah, I mean, they're using lots of, they can use lime and other types of products to supplement the soil in order to decrease in areas where it's been impacted by acid okay, so rain, for example. To do that. I, yeah, I can imagine, and maybe somebody in the audience knows that better than I, but. Uh, but yeah, I've, a lot of lime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, in terms of the economics, that's a good question. I'll have to ask some of the folks that I you know up in Tunbridge about that. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, Chris. Are we going to have any white ash trees 25 years from now? What can you tell us about the ash borer? Yeah, uh, emerald ash borer. Um, well, it's I, I don't I thought I had one in my collection. Um, I mean, it, you know, it's not in Vermont yet. I think it's just a matter of, of getting here. I mean, it's right over, it's not too far over the border in, in uh, uh, New Hampshire and New York. Um, there will be ash trees, white ash, green ash. Um, but it's going to be, I think, a bit like the beach bark disease where you're not, you know, you don't see any really nice big beaches anymore. Um, that's, uh, there's not going to be a lot of really nice big uh, white ashes as these come through. When I worked on this species in Michigan, uh, basically what it does is it removes all the big ones first and then it leaves all the small ones behind. So there'll be a general wave of the impact that comes through. Um, and it really depends on the forest structure, whether it's very diverse, how much white ash is there and so forth of you know, the magnitude of those impacts. But it's going to wipe out uh, most likely all of the big things and leave really the small ones behind. And as those small ones start to turn into big trees, they're probably going to get attacked the quickest. And, that, and the reason for that is, is that most uh, insects, herbivorous insects, ones that eat uh, leaves and trees, for example, they go after the big things first. Uh, and that tends to be why you see the bigger ones getting uh, you know, off of the landscape. Uh, so yeah, there will be white ash, but there's going to be a really big change in terms of what we call the, the size class distribution in the forest, where there's a little, there's a few, you know, big trees, a few, lots of small trees, and then there's a lot in the middle. There's probably not going to be a lot of uh, middle to bigger sized trees left. At least that's a that's a prediction. You mentioned uh, predators. Are there particular predators that, I guess, the the, be the whichever beetles you were talking about. Are there particular predators and are there ways of attracting those predators? Yeah, uh, that's a, there's a lot of different uh, answers for that. So it, it really depends on the species. Uh, bark beetles, uh, and actually this is work I didn't talk about, this is work that I did right before I left Dartmouth. Um, Southern pine beetle uh, basically uses its pheromones to attract all of its friends to come, hey, let's kill a tree. Well, it actually also is a, a predator's picked up on that scent and follows them around the forest. And it was thought for a long time uh, because there's this very specialist natural enemy that tracks it around this forest that it must be important to suppressing outbreaks. Uh, some work that I will take credit for basically put the nail in that coffin. Basically, the southern pine beetle drives the predator populations and it doesn't seem to be the other way around at the very large landscape kind of scale. Um, Moths and uh, butterflies, the caterpillars, their populations tend, uh, at least the big outbreaking ones uh, that have these big kind of boom, kind of bust cycles, those are all driven by interactions with natural enemies. So as they get really abundant, uh, the predators, natural enemies catch up to them and then they really, and there's some really strong evidence to suggest that they're going to decrease them. Uh, there's a real, I'll, I'll give you in a second, there's a real 
impetus to be putting out natural enemies from Asia against uh, emerald ash borer. Um, right now, emerald ash borer is so abundant that even if you remove 99.9% .9 of the population, you still probably have billions of animals out there. Uh, the likelihood that natural enemies are really going to suppress those populations, um, I, I think that the likelihood is really low. Uh, those, those organisms might be more important in preventing small populations to becoming really, really uh, from big populations. And that's sort of the general theme is that wood borers and bark beetles, uh, once they get going, once they get really, really abundant, you, the only thing that's going to stop them from killing trees are really cold winters or management that removes them. Uh, but predators and natural enemies, when they, when they sort of, when cold winters sort of like knock them back to what we call these endemic sort of levels, non-pest levels, that's where the predators might have the, uh, the important ability from preventing them from getting really, really abundant. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, but you don't want to introduce another foreign species. Well, that, that's a, yeah, they're, 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 that's a debate and um, something that, so, you know, we try to provide the best evidence based on the ecology of these organisms and some people who go and may make decisions based on this and not. Um, I think it comes down to, as I was saying a bit about the adelgid, you really need to understand the biology of the organism. Um, they're doing a lot of predator releases on the adelgid as well and they're not having any impacts. And I think part of that is because we don't understand uh, the actual natural history and essentially the influence of climate on its uh, daily rhythms, um, which is really, really important because you can uh, be looking at the adelgid, you know, over in this valley and then go over here and they're completely different uh, age structures. Their development is, is, is completely different because of microclimate and so forth. Is very, then that's a very different scenario for a predator uh, and, how, and how they survive in those particular habitats. Yeah? Um, um, you must be familiar with uh, the 16-year study, 1920 to 1936, ending up with Senate Document 264, which was the secret session of Congress about the nutrition for the plants. And in the book, Folk Medicine, it talks about the fact that even though that we might be suffering from malnutrition on the land, the rivers take the, the, the nutrients to the ocean, and the ocean isn't suffering from malnutrition at all. And kelp is the richest source of iodine of the plant, seaweed is. And this uh, kelp is a, or seaweed is the leaves of these trees and that grow in, in the ocean, and they grow 700 feet tall, sometimes 50 feet a year. and it, uh, um, they're the richest source of iodine on the planet. Um, well, uh, yeah, stepping outside, the sort of, I was just down in Acadia National Park last weekend working on some sort of long-term conservation planning, and uh, they have some, you're absolutely, I mean, there's a lot of people maybe that have caught wind of this. So there's a lot of kelp uh, producers and wanting to farm kelp for that exact reason. I don't know if about it iodine, but just as it's a very good dietary uh, supplement. Anyway, I don't, yeah. You mentioned the American chestnut and resistance to the chestnut blight. Just curious as to how big an effort is the molecular biology side of this to attempt to clone the um, various trees for uh, higher resistance, ones that are uh, there's a long history of that, and uh, I'm not familiar with a lot of. I mean, obviously they've gone along, they've gone out and uh, used these techniques to, I think, uh, understand the resistance uh, in the natural area. Do they do that? Uh, they didn't have these tools probably before all of the big ones were dead. That might have had some of the adult trees that had some of this resistance. They're probably now looking at some of the old stumps and things that are left behind. But a lot of the resistance has now been, research has been focused in China uh, and Asia to bring back Chinese uh, genotypes that then they hybrid. And actually my great uncle, had, he was a part of this whole chestnut foundation. He's got some chestnuts in Maine in his yard that are basically the uh, Chinese uh, hybrids or whatever. So that's my understanding that that's where a lot of the effort has been, is using um, non-native uh, resistance genes and, and putting them into our uh, native uh, trees to try to bring into that resistance. And, and that gets back to that point that I was saying before is that 
maybe there's in some there are opportunities to look at particularly at native genotypes that we want to essentially reforest our trees versus spending the money and effort to go elsewhere to you know to do those but again you know when uh, chestnut blight hit and now are two very different times in terms of the te scientific technology that's available yes I, I feel like there's this huge white elephant in the room and I I just have to point it out. Uh, you're young, you're obviously very talented and doing a lot of good work. How do you how do you stand with your president who doesn't believe in your science and doesn't believe in global warming? How, how do you cope? I, I, I'm at a loss personally. Yeah, uh, good. that's a hard question. Are we, are we still on video tape? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, if you don't want to answer that, you don't have to. But no, I, I, I'm here representing myself, uh, really. I mean, uh, to directly answer your question, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, ridiculous. I mean, we, you know, there's uh, the science is there. I don't even say it just because I've been a part of that science, but, um, but, but I think that the science is really strong. Uh, the evidence that we have seen with the... Uh, with the southern pine beetle and other western bark beetles that I've worked on, uh, it's really relevant. Um, but I guess the other, you know, the other side of that too is it's not all climate as well. Uh, and this is where you know forest management is a huge component uh, of these stories. So I don't know. Again, I, maybe I'm just, I'm skirting around your question, but I, I, yeah, in, in general, um, I think a lot of us think this is going to be a big blip in the road. Uh, we don't have any kind of um, guidance on what we should and shouldn't say. Park Service seems to be pretty strong about promoting that climate change is real and that we need to do things about it. Um, what are the political ramifications of that? We don't really know. Well, we know that our programs are going to get slammed this next year. Uh, and that's going to have a, a huge impact on the way uh, that we do all sorts of things. Uh, my program uh, collects uh, monitoring data in about 10 different ecological systems from the rocky coast shoreline uh, in Maine up into our upland uh, forest um, systems and actually VCE helps us with some of that monitoring um, and cutting funds from the EPA uh, and the Park Service is going to have a major impact on our programs and the inference that we can sort of essentially you know what, what are the conclusions that we can draw from that uh, so again, I think we're kind of waiting to see, um, and it's it's absolutely frustrating. Can I just say that uh, Aaron, it's awfully refreshing to hear from someone who's obviously so knowledgeable and clearly passionate about what they study. Um, I hope we all get a chance to thank Aaron. I'm sure he'll stick around, point out some of his specimens, sign some autographs for those in the audience. <laughs> and um, please, thank you, Aaron, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around.